Well, Toby, uh, today for the first time, I ran out of ink in my pen as I was shutting down <laughs> these important, important thoughts. And I saw that you just mentioned Zaretta Hammond. I am so happy you did that because she's coming to the Glenbard Parents Series next year. She'll be with us talking to the teachers on October 11th at Institute Day, and then she'll be talking to the parents on February 1st. So Fabulous. thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, you know, just so, so much uh, about, it's not about asking what's wrong with you. It's about what's happening, what happened to you. It's about caring for ourselves. Only then can we care for others. Uh, let's take some questions. Amber, uh, you have a question? Well, there's one in the chat. Uh, it actually says, Tovi, much gratitude for your teachings today. Please speak to us about how much how you approach educators about the way mindfulness supports the social and emotional learning for adults and students. Mm -hmm. And that's from Lori from Roanoke City Public Schools. Great. Hi, Lori. Uh, much of what you've listened to today is part of my approach in how I uh, do this work with educators and teachers. And we really start with the emotional space that this work brings up for us because we really can't do the work without getting past the emotions. It's the emotions that generally um, overtake people that create any fear or resistance. And so once we get past the emotions, then we're able to really do the work. And part of getting past the emotions is honoring our self-awareness, honoring our self-compassion, honoring self-regulation. How do we do those things at the top of the castle wheel to then do the other things at the bottom? You spoke about the importance of modeling and we have parents on the line. Um, can you talk with that about that again? Just reminding us how important that modeling piece is. Yeah. Thank you. Our, our children and our students are always watching. They're always paying attention to the adults. And so that old adage, you know, they don't listen to what we say. They pay more attention to what we do. Same thing. We have to always be modeling what we want our kids to see because they're paying attention to our behaviors and our actions. And that's what really matters most. So if we can have that self-awareness and self-regulation to, to know that we're always teaching. As parents, we are our children's first teachers. So we're always teaching. And then once they're in our classrooms, then we're really their teachers. So every interaction is an opportunity to model your best self. It's an opportunity to model a skill, all right? Uh, I love what you talked about when you, the sacred space, if, if there was a word, a mantra, and we went to sacred space. So tell us once more, sacred space, what does that mean to you? Sacred space is really around um, the sanctuary that we create within ourselves that allows us to regulate that allows us to tap into that current moment of what we're feeling and then taking that sacred pause, which is just that deep breath. That is like, ooh, now that I've, I've connected to myself, my breath, my source of power, now I know how I wanna respond. So the sacred space is yourself as that inner sanctuary to practice these tools of the sacred pause and then have a skillful response. Someone who's a, a beginner and is coming to this for the first time, where's a good place to start with mindfulness, meditation? Yeah, wonderful question. I'm a purist and people often tease me about that. But I, when I started meditating when I was 22, there weren't all these apps and guided meditations and YouTube and all of that. So truly, I sat down and started breathing. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was instructed to do by my own teacher. It was like, sit down and breathe. Mm -hmm. People have a hard time with that. Um, sometimes as a place to start, because we all have what we call monkey mind. So our mind is wandering. All the thoughts are coming in. You're thinking you got to clear your head. Mm -hmm. The goal is not necessarily to clear your head. The goal is to be centered. And so what you can do in what I recommend is that people find an app that they may like. Uh, they can also listen to a meditation on YouTube. 
also there are more and more communities of people that are meditating. Mm -hmm. Schools are meditating now. There are teacher groups that are meditating. COSM has chapters of people who are meditating together. So there's so many resources now, Gilda, that weren't available. And um, I mean, really, you can type in meditation and just so much is going to come up now. So to answer your question really directly, you just have to sit and start doing it. That's where it starts to work. The more that we read about it or, you know, just like, oh, I read this book. Now I'm going to do it. It doesn't work by reading the book. You really need to just start doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about our stories take us into healing. Um, I heard someone say that we can disagree about just about everything, but we can't disagree about our stories. So can you speak to that once again? Why it's important to share stories? How do we, how do, we do that? Absolutely. Someone's story is their story. So I don't know how anyone could disagree with it. Uh, a lot of people will push back on someone's lived experience, which just really shows their own limited thinking. And so when we are able to, and the fact that perhaps they haven't found the compassion to honor their own stories, because with our stories, sometimes comes shame, mm -hmm. embarrassment, blame, hurt, emotions that make us vulnerable and not want to fully be seen because we can't trust who is seeing us. We can't trust how we're going to be met and how our story will be held. And our stories are sacred um, from our indigenous ancestors. Our stories are sacred. Our, our oral tradition and oral history going back before the written word and, and paper and pen and so when we want to honor someone's story, it's like honoring them. To honor someone else's story, you have to first honor your own. And self-love. Talk about self-love. So many people think that self-care piece is selfish. So how do we overcome that? Um, self-care is definitely not selfish. It is one of the most loving things that you can do, but it's so challenging in our society and especially in our profession. Um, as educators, we're taught to just give, give, give until we have no more. In our society, parents are taught to give, give, give until you have no more. I love um, this definition around self-care, and it helped me tremendously. It helped me shift my lens and grow my own boundaries around self-care. And self-care is not about keeping people out. And like when I used to think about boundaries and self-care, I think, oh, I have to be more aggressive and I have to put a wall up and I have to, you know, don't bother me now and have that tone. No one wants to be that or do that. But when you think about self-care boundaries, self-care is about putting a circle around what is sacred for me. And when we can put a circle around something, there's a gentleness to that. And people can see the circle. Another framing for that is self-care allows me to love me, you to love me, and me to love you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Gilda, there was one more question in the chat that I'm wondering if we have time for. Um, and that was uh, uh, Laura put in the Q and a that her son says school hurts me, which mm. may be another way of saying, I'm not feeling it. Like you mentioned, Toby. Mm. So um, he said that from time to time while he's been school avoidant this past year. So she's wondering as a mother, what could she do to help him or what could the school do possibly more than what they've already tried? Um, I'm not fully aware of what has been tried yet, but I know that Students and children are resilient. They will heal when we provide them with healing opportunities. And so what is happening in terms of offering your son support? Who is he talking to about what is happening? How specific has he been able to name how school is hurting him? And um, have there been conferences where the teacher is present, your son is present, you are present, and maybe someone else who is an advocate or even a therapist, if, if that's the route that you all have gone. So just being able to really explore it from, from a team place, 
But patience is really important as well. Give your son space to heal. You know, this is very timely, this question. Uh, this has come up a lot lately about the school avoidance issue. And I'm very excited that on March 3rd, we're welcoming Dr. Mona Della Hook, and she will be talking about this very topic, school avoidance, school refusal, about how our behaviors are just the tip of the iceberg. And it's here, it's here that, that we need to go. So I hope you'll come back. A last question for you, Toby. What keeps you hopeful in these challenging times? My belief in the power to heal and my belief in humanity. Absolutely. I, um, I have a huge growth mindset. I was raised with a growth mindset and I have seen the power of what self-transformation can do for our leadership and what self-transformation can do for those that are leading the way and honoring others and working with those that we serve. And so that is what keeps me hopeful. That's going to, that's, those are words I'm going to take with me today. And I, and I will take all of these 10 pages of notes and thoughts with me as I go forward. It was so wonderful to have you joining us today. I'm so very, very grateful. Uh, I know we'll have you back. Amber, it was great to have you here today. And everyone who took the time and trusted us, uh, valued the Glenbard Parent Series, we're so grateful. And we'll see you all next time. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.